majesty, Lord of all, let every throne before him fall, the King of kings, O come adore our God who reigns forevermore, majesty. Hallelujah. That's why we've come this morning to lift our voices to praise and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Just think someday we'll stand before him, we'll bow before him, we'll cast our crowns before his feet. He so much deserves all our praise and worship. We are excited that you're here this morning. We're going to start off this morning with a very exciting announcement by Marcus Brunstetter uh, regarding our men's retreat. Following him, we'll hear from Doug Chen as we pray for our own next missionaries, Max and Jen Wilings. Good morning. Good morning. Just to make a brief announcement uh, to the men out there. Um, as you can see, we've been advertising the past few weeks about the men's retreat. We are still having it. Uh, we're going to make some changes in food items, but we are going to push through and have the teaching, which is the most important part. So if you are a man, we're, we're going to use 16 and up. We're trying to bring it down an age a bit. We want you to bring your sons if they're, if they're of um, a mature age. And we're going to be looking into waging war on sin. Uh, it's not the most fun topic, but it's a topic I think we need, uh, especially as men, to, to lead and as a, as a church to, to help and encourage each other through these times. Listen to Paul's words in Romans 7, 21 to 25. He says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see my members and other law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind. With my flesh I serve the law of sin. It's a struggle for everyone, including Paul, but God has called us not only to be holy, but to lead our families, communities, and church in holiness. With the incessant temptation to do evil, how do we accomplish this? We do this by waging war on sin. Join us as we learn how, together, we can victoriously battle sin at work, at home, and in our alone time. I want to encourage everyone to come by, we're, we're going to have a study, we're going to have prayer, we're going to have plenty of food, we're going to have tournaments, games, and we'll also have times of discussion. Uh, Pastor Jeremy and myself will be doing the teaching. If you have any questions or any comments, please feel free to email me, call me, email Pastor Jeremy, um, and don't hesitate to come out. If you can sign up soon, that'd be great. Uh, the sooner the better so we can get a good count on who's coming for food and things like that. Thank you. Hey, good morning, church. Um, this morning we have a privilege to pray for Max and Jen Wilings, um, and I'm going to have them come up here if it's not too much trouble. As we don't always have our missionaries with us, uh, it's a privilege that they are in a local ministry called Haycock Camping Ministries. Uh, they serve mostly children and families, but do have other retreats. Um, Haycock is only about 30 minutes from here, so uh, you can always check it out or even uh, volunteer. But Today we are going to pray for them. Uh, if you can get your golden rod uh, pieces of paper out, um, we're going to pray just a couple minutes in silence, and then I will close us uh, corporately.
Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being a God who um, seeks us out uh, in all situations, Lord. Um, we just thank you, Lord, for the ministry at Haycock Camping, Lord, um, and the ministry that Max and Jen uh, provide in that situation, Lord. Um, we just praise you for uh, all the things that you have done uh, there over this summer in, in the midst of COVID, Lord. Um, you gave them uh, five weeks to do ministry with, with children, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the day camp ministry as well as the overnight week, Lord, um, and for the, the many children that came. We especially praise your name for the eight children who made a commitment to, to follow you, Lord. Um, that's just amazing, Lord, to see new young believers come into our family. I just praise you, Lord, for um, just all you're doing there. We just lift up some prayers, Lord, for, um, and praises, actually, for Jen and, and recovering from Lyme disease, but we pray, Lord, that you would just continue to make her uh, recovery smooth, Lord. We pray for the, the fall programs and things that uh, are not completely set because of what's going on in this world, Lord. We just pray that you would just um, give them wisdom and um, the knowledge to know how to handle the different fall programs. Um, and we also just lift up the camping ministries in general. Um, Haycock has been blessed um, amidst COVID, Lord, but we know that many of the camping ministries around the world have been greatly affected, Lord. Um, so we pray, Lord, that you would just be with each of those camping ministries, help them to um, continue to do your work in, in that space, Lord. We just thank you for Max and Jen. We thank you for uh, the ways that they serve at Haycock. We pray that you would just continue to bless that ministry. And we thank you that you uh, bring them in as part of our, our local church, Lord. We praise you things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother. In our call to worship this morning, I want you to listen to the psalmist as he calls us to worship. Psalm 113, verses 1 through 5. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above, all, above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high? We've come this morning to praise and worship our God. That is our focus. That is why we are here. So let's stand and begin to focus and to sing his praises. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. And as we, set, as we just shared that passage of scripture about praise, uh, that we respond with what he has done for us with adoration and honor and, and glory to God. So let's sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. In tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I will sing my great Redeemer's praise. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow. can make the foulest clean his blood avail for me Hallelujah I will sing 
rejoice, we give all praise to him, and we continue to fix our eyes on Jesus and the cross and what he suffered for us. Hallelujah for the cross. We can gather here because of what Jesus did for us. Let's sing together. on these words. I will be hopeless without your goodness. I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness, if it wasn't for the cross. But you have won. What does the cross mean? What is salvation in Jesus Christ? You'll see a steady theme throughout this worship and going in through the book of Acts that Christ is all in all, that he is our salvation, he's our fortress in times of trouble. So when we gather here as a congregation to worship and praise the name of Jesus, 
we're shedding everything else. We come here to offer ourselves holy, set apart for his use, for his glory. So I, I pray that as we prime our hearts for Pastor Tim's preaching of God's word from the book of Acts, that we're letting go, that we're laying aside everything so that the spirit of God can move in power and the presence of God can be manifest through us to a world that needs to see the hands and feet of Jesus and needs to see the gospel manifest to them in their neighborhoods. So let's pray as, as we sing this song, The Lord is My Salvation, that we reflect on these words of how do we demonstrate that to a world in desperate need, more than ever before in my lifetime, the need of Jesus Christ and salvation only through Jesus. Let's sing these words together.
glorious words we've just sung. You may be seated. Let's take some time to go before the throne of grace this morning and just thank our great God for this great salvation that he has given us. Oh, Father, where can we begin to express our thanksgiving and praise and adoration for this great salvation that you have given us it is so great when we see our hopelessness, when we saw that the fact that we were born in sin, we were children of wrath. Your wrath was upon us because of our rebellion against you. But oh, oh God, you quickened us, you made us alive. You gave us the faith to believe. You have given us the salvation through your son's death on the cross. He bore our sins and your wrath upon him on our behalf. And Father, we come this morning with thanksgiving and praise in our hearts, for you are the God of our great salvation. We thank you, O oh Father, for originating this salvation. We thank you, Jesus, the Son, for being our sacrifice and atoning for our sins. We thank you, O Holy Spirit, for regenerating, making us alive, applying this salvation. Who is like our God? There is none like you, O God. And we praise you, we worship you this morning. O Father, we pray that you would help us this Reality gives us hope in the midst of a hopeless world. Father, we know that we don't know what's going to happen next, that, that the truth is just so veiled at times, and yet, Father, we know that you are our stronghold, our salvation, that we have hope in the midst of a hopeless time. Keep us, Father. Keep us strong. Keep us focused on you. Keep us about the business you have given us of reconciliation, bringing pre people to Jesus Christ, introducing them to the good news of the gospel. I pray that we would live holy lives that would be recognized in a dark world as something peculiar, something different. And Father, we would keep those who are ailing this morning, those who are ailing physically, those who are ailing emotionally, May they look to this great salvation as the solid rock in their lives. Father, prepare our hearts now as we are about to hear from you in your word. I pray that you would remove the distractions that so easily enter our minds and our hearts. And there that you would prepare a fertile soil for the seed of your word to be planted. That it would grow and, and, and there would be much fruit that would come forth from it that we would be transformed by the power of your word this morning. We pray in the Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Again, we want to welcome you this morning. We're so excited to see you all here. And if there were any visitors with us this morning, we, we would pray that our regular attenders would look around to see someone who's new and, and just introduce yourself after the service this morning. If you are a visitor with us this morning, we'd like you to go online or use the church app if you want to download it. And there is a connect card in there electronically. Just fill that out so we can get to know who you are. We also want to make mention that God has given us so much so we have the opportunity. It is a biblical thing for us to give back to God a portion of what he's given to us. And we have a number of ways of doing that. We can go online. You can use our app. You can do the, a, a bank pay. And you can just put it in the offering plate as you leave when you go out those doors. As we prepare our hearts to receive the word of God, let's listen to the song.
Amen. Thank you, guys. Good morning. Good to see you this morning at Ebenezer. Open your Bibles to the book of Acts this morning as the highlight of our services now, sitting at the feet of Jesus as we go to the Word of God, the inspired and errant, infallible, perfect Word of God, able to feed our souls, to bring us to salvation for those who don't know Christ, and to equip those believers that we might be ready to do great works for God in this world. That's why we study each and every week. We gather together, and we sit, and we study God's Word. And if you've not been with us, we've begun a new series in the book of Acts. We've entitled this series, Empowered for the Mission. Empowered for the Mission. And I want to say good morning to you on our live stream this morning. Glad that you're with us. Hope you have your Bibles open there to study with us. Can you think in your own life of some promises that you've not kept? Have you, are you a promise keeper? I think when we think of society, we think of uh, lots of opportunities where people just don't keep their promises. Promises in marriage, promises to their kids, promises to work, promises, promises, promises. And yet when we come to Scripture, we find that God is the great promise keeper. God is the one who is unfolding his great plan of salvation and he keeps his promises to his covenant people and Acts chapter 2 is simply the outpouring of God's promise that he said he was going to send the Holy Spirit. This morning I've entitled the message, The Promise Given, particularly the birth of the church. In Acts chapter 1, we gloriously saw that the disciples were waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 2, the Spirit comes. In chapter 1, the disciples were equipped. In chapter 2, the disciples were empowered. In chapter 1, they were held back. In chapter 2, they were sent forth. In chapter 1, the Savior ascended into heaven. In chapter 2, the Holy Spirit descends now on the people of God, on the believers, the 120 that were gathered there in the upper room, there in Jerusalem, waiting just as Jesus said for them to do. Obediently, they went to the room, they waited, and now in chapter 2, we come to, to really one of the most transitional chapters in the unfolding of God's plan in all of history. And this chapter really reveals to us what Christianity is all about. Christianity is not men gathering to do things. It's amazing. Chapter 4 tells us, it tells us very clearly that these disciples were ignorant and uneducated men, and yet something radically transformed them, that they were able, by the power of the Spirit, to transform the world, to use the Scripture's words, turn the world upside down. And you say, well, how did all of this happen? Was this man's idea? no. We see in chapter 2 of Acts that God acted. God, this was God's work. This is the action of God, not just the work of a handful of people. So many have a wrong view of the church. The church is not just some state religion. The church is not some place where we'd have, official, have an official religion or have coronations or special burials of people. It's not a place where we just do certain ceremonies like baptisms of, of children. They, some churches do this, christenings or even marriages or funerals. Uh, the church is not some building where I'm going to church. What is the church? Here in this, in this chapter, we see that the church was in the mind of God and that God was going to pour out His Spirit on His people so that the people of God become the temple of the Holy Spirit. In this passage, we see that God does something from heaven. He sends something from heaven as a rushing mighty wind into the people of God. We could say it this way, the living God, the God who's always been the living and active God in all the universe, has come down and met his people. The disciples here in this particular passage had to wait. What are they waiting on? Waiting for God to act. This morning, the promise given, as we see this glorious story about the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. If you have a Bible there, always pick up a Bible on the way in if you don't have a Bible. Um, roughly page 909 in the Pew Bible, in my Bible. 
I hope you can find that place. At Ebenezer, we like to stand in honor of God's word as we read it. So why don't you stand with me? Let's read this glorious text together, and then we're going to study it and try to understand it the best way we can, all right? So chapter 2, verse 1, the promise given. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. That is the 120. If you go back up to verse 15, surely the, the 11... Apostles were there. There were also women and others and 120. So it's probably all of these together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Philampia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. Let's bow our heads together as we pray. Father in heaven, we love you. We beg you now that the Holy Spirit would come and illumine this particular text for us and teach us that the Holy Spirit would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and that our minds would understand what the Scripture is teaching us about this incredible transition missionary moment on the day of Pentecost when the Old Covenant would be gone and the New Covenant would begin and the age of the Spirit would begin, known as the church age. Father, we pray you'd bless this time now as we study your Word. Give us insight. I pray that if there would be anyone here today that is still lost in their sins, that today they would not mock the Word of God, but they would receive the Word of God, which is able to save them from their souls. And I pray that, Father, you would equip the saints. And Father, there's much confusion in regard to this passage. We pray, Lord, that you would give us insight. Lord, that we might be fully equipped to understand what has happened in history, what's happening in the future, in a, even in our own lives. We pray your blessings now as we study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Keep your Bibles open. In your bulletin is an outline for those online watching. There's a place for you to take notes. We're going to be studying this morning. Simple outline. We'll be just looking at three things like we typically do, particularly about this coming of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Spirit. And what I'd like you to see is this major theme here that is that just as promised, According to God's divine timetable, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Feast of Pentecost. And what was happening was that this was the inauguration of the new church age. Oftentimes, I don't know if you've ever heard it said this way, there was the age of the Father in the Old Testament, the age of the Son as He came to the earth and revealed Himself, and now from Pentecost on is known as the, spirit, the age of the Spirit of God, also known as the church age. Here, in my understanding of this text, is the birth of the church. Jesus said, I will, future tense, build my church. And here we see the establishment of the church. And next time we're together, Peter will preach and 3,000 souls will be added to the church. In order to help us as we get, walk through this particular passage, we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the sign, signs of the coming of the Spirit. We're going to look at the impact of that uh, coming of the Holy Spirit and then the response to the Spirit's coming. So let's dive in. These three things, the signs, the impact, 
and the response. Number one, let's look at the signs of the coming of the Spirit. Now this is a significant event in the unfolding of God's plan. It's not by accident that God chooses to use the day of Pentecost. Look at verse 1. What does Luke record for us? The disciples have been waiting in the upper room. You remember it's been 10 days. They waited 10 days and God equipped them. That was last week's message. God equipped them in their waiting to do what they needed to do. They prayed together. They studied the word together. All of these things, they were preparing for this day. And now the day of Pentecost has come. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Certainly they were in that upper room. Chapter 1, verse 13, there were most likely all 120 of them gathered together, the disciples, as well as others. Remember we talked about maybe Nicodemus being there, maybe Joseph of Arimathea there, some of the women, certainly those who had been healed by Jesus were there. True disciples of Jesus, true followers of Jesus were there. And now we shouldn't expect that this something happened by accident, but rather now, based upon God's timetable, and I want to challenge you, go back and make, make note of this particular chapter, Leviticus chapter 23, unfolds for us the feasts of Israel. And if you look at the feasts of Israel, you'll notice very clearly that God is working and unfolding His plan through the order of the feasts, if you will. I can kind of prove it to you. You remember there were three great feasts. The first great feast was the Feast of Passover. You remember where the children of Israel came out of Egypt and God spared them as they took the Passover lamb, took the blood and put it over their doorposts and they were spared from death. In the same way, God unfolded His plan of redemption now through His Son, the Lord Jesus, who was the ultimate Passover lamb. So, 50 days prior to this event, Christ was crucified. The second feast was the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which would have happened on the following uh, Sunday, the day after Passover. That particular feast was a feast of offering the first fruits, if you will, of the grain harvest on that Sunday, the day after Passover, after uh, the Sabbath. And wouldn't it be appropriate that the first fruits would be the resurrection of Christ? offering himself as the first one to be resurrected from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, tells us that Jesus was the first fruits. So Passover, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And now, 50 days, in fact, that's what Pentecost means, the 50th. 50 days after Passover, we see this third great feast where God now also begins to unfold his plan. And here... At Pentecost, there would also have been another offering of first fruits made. I said this the last couple of weeks. Here on this particular day, we're going to see Peter preaches here on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 souls are added to the church. Again, this is these would have been the first fruits of God adding them to the church. Now, notice this, and I, I want to highlight this. This is the evidence of God's sovereign providence. Some charismatics wrongly interpret this passage at many levels. We'll talk about some of that this morning. But notice this, that the Spirit was not induced to come because the believers prayed or because they tarried or they met certain conditions. No, rather the unfolding of God's plan was providentially unfolded, if you will. I'm not saying it wasn't important for them to pray and prepare themselves. But it was on the day of Pentecost that God had determined that the Holy Spirit would come from heaven. And He did. He did. And Luke tells us that this was the sovereign design of God from the beginning. Now notice there were two signs. And let's talk about these signs. The signs of the Spirit's coming. Look at verse 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound Notice this, like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. There are two signs that Luke records for us. They're both similes. Um, Notice the word like. They were like these things. All right, so what are they? Well, here's the first one. 
there was an auditory sign and a visual sign. The first is an auditory sign. By, by the way, notice that these, they came from heaven. They came from heaven. Again, this is God acting. This is God starting the church, beginning the church. And the Holy Spirit fell, by the way, notice, only on the house where the believers were sitting. They alone received the promise um, of the Spirit. To, say, to use a term that I'm going to define here in just a moment, they were baptized with the Spirit. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But here's the first sign. There was an, an auditory for the ear. An ear. And notice what it says. Suddenly... There came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It wasn't a wind. It was like a wind. They could hear it. They could hear it. There's a rich background with this idea of wind in the Scripture. And I want to highlight this because I think this is important for us to consider what God was doing. Let's think about one of the first times we hear of something about wind. Well, you go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And it's interesting that as God was creating the heavens and the earth, you remember what he says about the earth in verses 1 and 2 in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was, remember, formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And you remember what the statement was next, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. That word hovering could also, um, could also imply the breath of God blowing over the earth of God. And you say, well, what was happening right there? Well, God was using his spirit to create the earth. Of course, we know Jesus was the great creator, but the spirit was using, being used. The spirit was over the earth, blowing over the earth, the very breath of God over the earth. God was in that moment giving life to the earth. Wonderful picture of, the, of this breath. Then you go to chapter, th chapter two and chapter three, and you'll see that Adam was created. You remember Adam was formed out of the dust of the earth. Boys and girls, you remember God took some dust and created fashion, a man, but he was lifeless. But then what happened? The Bible says God breathed life into him. That word, by the way, for breath is the same word for wind. God created the earth with wind, with the spirit. He created Adam with the wind. And then it shouldn't surprise us we come to the New Testament. Very clearly when Jesus was approached by Nicodemus at night, and Nicodemus, you remember, had great questions about what a person must do to be saved. And Jesus said to him, don't you know that you must be both born of water and the Spirit? Just as the wind blows, he says, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And there's a play on words there with Spirit and wind. Same word in the Greek, pneumos in the Greek. Same word here. What is Jesus saying? You must be born again through the Spirit, through the wind of God. And that's exactly what's happening here. This is a symbol. Now get the symbol. Get the picture. Get the sign. What is happening? The church is being born. People are being born again through the coming of the Holy Spirit. So the earth was created by the wind. Adam was created through the wind. Every person who comes into the church is born again through the coming of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit he came like a rushing, mighty wind. The church was being born by the Spirit of God as he came in into the church. Jesus, we could say it this way, had begun to build his church. I think we remind us there in chapter 2, um, I think in verse 40 or so, Jesus added the numbers to the church. Who is doing this? Jesus is doing it. Jesus, you remember, is at the right hand of the Father and he is orchestrating all of the details of what's happening in the unfolding of this church. So here's the first sign. It was an auditory sign, like a wind. But then secondly, there was a visual sign. A visual sign. The Holy Spirit came like, like tongues or as of tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Now again, this is not, these are not literal flames. Fire didn't come on them, but they were, it was like fire, like divided tongues of fire, like it, similar to it. 
We need to make a clear distinction here. I do not believe at all that this is in reference to Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Make note of that verse. Go back and look at it later. You'll see what I'm saying here. Oftentimes people will misinterpret this and say, well, this is just an outflow of Matthew 3, verse 11. I'll read it to you. Remember where Jesus, um, John the Baptist and Jesus is there and Jesus says, uh, John the Baptist says, one will come after me who will baptize you both with water and fire. I think the reference to Matthew 3.11 is not this fire, but the fire of judgment. It's very clear, I think, that that's the, the judgment to come. Jesus is going to, to bring judgment. But he will baptize us with the Holy Spirit. Now notice here the collective um, falling of the Spirit on all of them, and yet individually they received the Spirit. There was a visible sign. This visible flame rested on each one of them. That must have been a sight. I try to look up some pictures of what that might look like, and everybody just kind of makes it like a candle flame on each one of the individuals there in the room. But there was a visual sign that the Spirit had been poured out now, the text here, and I want to distinguish a couple of things here for us theologically. Can we work through this? This text does not speak of what is called the, the baptism. The word baptism is not here. But I want to infer to you that I believe this was the baptism of the Spirit for these believers. And on your outline, I'm going to give you two. We, we need to make a distinction between two different key phrases if we're going to understand theologically what happens. What's the difference between the baptism of the Spirit and the filling of the Spirit? All right? So on your outline, I'll give you a definition of the baptism of the Spirit. What is the baptism of the Spirit? Well, it's a one-time... Now notice all these words are very important. It's a one-time not a continual thing, non-experiential act of Christ by which he places believers into his body. That's why I say this is a baptism right here at the very beginning. These believers are being baptized, united together with Christ into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 very clear, and I'll give you a list of verses there for you to go look up. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, listen to this, for in one spirit we were all baptized in one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. All right, so if you're in Christ, something happens to you. Something non-experiential. Let me ask you, was your justification experiential? No. Was your adopt, when you were adopted into the body of Christ, was, was that experiential? No, it wasn't. It was a fact. And the baptism of the Spirit is no different to the companions of justification and uh, adoption. Very similar. Something radically happens to us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We're baptized into the body of Christ. Romans 6 speaks about that, being buried with Christ in baptism. Galatians chapter 3, listen to this, verse 26. Listen to this great verse. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So Paul says very clearly there in Galatians 3, you've trusted Jesus Christ by faith, and because of that, you were baptized into Christ, into his body. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 through 6 is also very clear. Listen to this verse. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. How many? One. One. Not many. One. One. One baptism into the body of Christ. Get this in your mind. One God and one Father of all who is over all and through all. When you come to Christ, you're baptized into the body of Christ. It's non-experiential. Non-experiential, it's a fact. Now that's different than this other term that we need to highlight. And if you look at the text here, notice it says, verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So let's differentiate the baptism of the Spirit, secondly, with the filling of the Spirit. And it's totally different. Totally different. It is experiential, and it is continuous. Notice my definition of being filled or filling of the Spirit. A continuous experience 
of every believer who empties himself and submits to the Word of God, allowing the Spirit to control him. So there's a sense in which this filling takes place, much like a sail, the sail of a sailboat. What happens? The wind fills the sail and carries the boat along as, he contr- as the wind controls the boat and pushes it this way or pushes it this way. So you and I as believers, what do we do? We empty ourselves of ourself and our self-will and we allow the Spirit of God to control us. And this is a continual activity of the believer. And by the way, it's a command. And I've said this before, and I hope you understand this. Nowhere in Scripture are we commanded to be baptized with the Spirit. Nowhere. So if some groups tell you, 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 need, to, you need to beg the Lord to, be, you know, to baptize you with this, that happens at your conversion. Nowhere in Scripture does it command us to be baptized with the Spirit. But yet there is a command to be filled. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. It's very clear, isn't it? Don't be drunk as believers. Don't be drunk with wine. But be filled with the Spirit. And by the way, when you go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, the evidence of being filled, no mention of tongues there. None. In fact, what is mentioned there is very clearly... Worship is mentioned. Submitting to one another is mentioned. Um, Praise is mentioned. All of those things. But notice here, they spoke in tongues. Let's Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. There are many places in Scripture, and I'll give you a few of these. You might jot a few of these. Uh, down if you're interested in being filled with the spirit is listen closely is not always accompanied with speaking in tongues and we're going to talk about speaking in tongues in just a moment but it's very clearly acts chapter 4 verse 8 peter preaches again a second time it says he was filled with the spirit it doesn't say he spoke in tongues there acts chapter 4 verse 31 uh, chapter 6 verse 5 chapter 7 verse 55 chapter 9 verse 17 i think i give those to you on your outline that, ne- that not necessarily uh, believers will be uh, speak in tongues. Now let's notice here, what are the tongues? The word Greek in the Greek word is the word glossa. And obviously and very clearly from this passage, this is not some ecstatic language. Notice what this passage reveals to us. This is a language, a human language. The ability to speak a human language that other people can hear and understand. Far from being some ecstatic speech here, the tongues spoken on the day of Pentecost were clearly known languages. Clearly known languages. Not gibberish, but a known language. Now it's interesting, when I went to, when I was a kid, I was roughly... Um, Naomi's age down here on the front. I was around 15. Are you about 15 years old? I went to a church across the street from my church in Guyman, Oklahoma. And I'll never forget that the youth pastor told us there, now listen, if you don't speak in tongues, then you've not been saved. And in fact, you're going to go to hell. That's what he told us. I never went home and I talked to my dad about it. My dad got me all straightened out about it. But it was really scary, a scary moment in, my, in our lives, of course, I'd had enough theology to know something doesn't sound right about this. But oftentimes the charismatics will come to this particular passage and say, well, um, you know, here they spoke in tongues, which if, if you want to be really pedantic about it here, the speaking in tongues was a gift. It was a gift, but I think it's tied to the being filled and not to the baptism of the Spirit. That's one argument. And secondly, it doesn't, the speaking in tongues is not gibberish, not some kind of gibberish. Which leads us to the fact, asking this question, does this gift of this language still exist today? And you know if you've been here at Ebenezer, you've heard my position on this. I'm a leaky secessionist at best, which would mean that if I don't say that there are no possibilities that this, lang- this gift is Possible. I've heard of some missionaries overseas who were able to speak to certain people in a language, <clears throat> not in gibberish, but in a language that 
preach the gospel to them. So I, I'm not going to say it can't happen, um, but for the most part, I, I believe this particular gift of speaking languages has ceased. Maybe in a place where there is no Bible, where there's no language recorded for them, no gospel recorded in the Word, possibly. But you say, well, what was the purpose of, these, of this speaking in tongues then? Well, first, make note of this. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, verses 21 through 22, tell us that the tongues was really a sign to unbelieving Israel. Now follow my argumentation. A sign to unbelieving Israel. And when you trace out this gift of tongues through the book of Acts, you'll see that there were three places in the book of Acts where tongues seemed to be associated with the coming of the Holy Spirit. And those are the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 19, the Gentiles through Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 47, and John the Baptist's disciples in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. You say, well, what's all the significance of this? Well, if you look at this, and then you go back to look at uh, the comments from the early church in Acts 15, the tongues and the speaking of the tongues was a clear sign to everyone that the Holy Spirit was being poured out on different groups of people. Because what were the Jews? They were very narrow-minded, weren't they? This is for us. They needed to see that the gospel was for the Samaritans whom they hated, the Gentiles whom they hated. And so these things were poured out so that the early church in Acts 15 said this, listen clearly, and God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them having cleansed their hearts by faith. That was the early church's designation of all this, description of all of this. God is pouring out his, his spirit on all kinds of people. So the gift of language was, was a sign of the transition between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, a transition that I think is complete. Complete. So here are the signs, these two signs. An audible sign and a visual sign. A visual sign. The signs of His coming. Unmistakable. He, the Holy Spirit manifested His presence to the ears, to the eyes, and to the mouths of believers and had such an impact on all of those hearing. And that leads us to number two, the impact of the Spirit's coming. The impact, not just the signs, but in verses 5 through 11, we see the impact of this incredible coming of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, <clears throat> devout men from every nation under heaven. I love this. You say, well, why were these men in Jerusalem? Well, they were there because they were devout I love that word devout. It's a description of love for God, love for Christ. And here these men were, and these people were devout followers of Yahweh. Why were they there in Jerusalem? Well, they were there to celebrate Pentecost. Every year, this great feast, one of the three great major feasts, was required to be celebrated in Jerusalem. So consequently, these Jews were living in Jerusalem at the time of the Pentecost. They were devout men, notice, from every nation under heaven. I think that's idiomatic. That's a phrase which means simply from many lands, from all the nations. We're going to see here there's a whole list of them. <clears throat> so they're there. And notice God placed them there. God was orchestrating all of this. Unfolding His plan, they were there because God was going to pour out his Spirit, and of course there, the Spirit's going to be poured upon them in this chapter, verse 14. Chapter uh, 2, verse 14, Peter's going to preach, and many of them are going to come to know uh, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Verse 6, at the sound of the multitude, at the sound of the wind, I think this is the wind, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying not all are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? And then Luke records for us the different places where they are. A couple of things here for you to think about. But I think this is what is happening at Pentecost. God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus have this desire to spread the gospel around the world. So two things. The Spirit moves 
when filled believers witness by speaking the word. That's one of the lessons we learn here. When filled believers speak the word, give witness to the word, the Holy Spirit works. He's working. Now that's a great application for us. You've been filled with the Spirit. Hopefully that's who you are. You're a part of the church. Not because you're a member of here. Not because you attend here. Not even because you've been water baptized. Those are all important. But you're here because the Holy Spirit has in, come inside of you and dwelt you. And you're a part of the church because of that. And when we speak the Word of God, notice God works. God moves. When Phil believers witness, and that's what they're doing here, um, they're, they're giving witness to the great deeds of God, the wonderful works of God. And the Holy Spirit is, is working. This is a supernatural miracle. And the attention of the crowd is gathered. They're there. They're amazed. They're hearing uh, the languages. And they're saying, how is this happening? Why is this a miracle? They say, well, aren't these Galileans? Now, what's the significance of them being Galileans? Well, Galileans were typically known as uneducated, ignorant people, kind of country folk, not knowing much things. And they're saying, how do these uneducated, these ignorant men, how are they able to speak in our languages? And there's at least 10 of them, 10 different languages here. Secondly, number two, the Spirit desires to send the gospel over all the world. Now, how do you know that? Well, look at the list of places these people have come from. And I'm not going to list them all again, but I do have a map for you. And I love maps. Look at this map right here. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's Jerusalem. And there are all the different places mentioned. Crete, just south of Greece. Rome, Pontus to the north, Cappadocia, Asia, Minor, all these places of an Asia Minor, over down into Egypt and Cyrene and over um, where current day Iran and Iraq are over there, the Mesopotamia area. The whole area is surrounded. And what is God doing? He's bringing these people, guess where they're going to go after this? They're going to go home and they're going to tell the gospel. They're going to speak the gospel to others. Oh, the desire of the Spirit is to send the gospel to all the world. Oh, the impact of this day. It would have incredible impact on all of the world. And that leads to the third point, number three, the response of the Spirit's coming. Sadly, it's always divided. In verses 12 and 13, we see the response of the crowds. Verse 12, all were amazed and perplexed saying to one another, what does this mean? But in contrast, others were mocking, saying they are filled with new wine. Isn't this sad that every crowd will always be divided, it seems? There will be some, number one, some who are attracted to the gospel message. What were they hearing? They were hearing the great things of God. They were hearing the great works of God. And the Holy Spirit would save many of them some of them were attracted to this great message. And yet others were simply mocking the gospel message. They were mocking it, saying, oh, these people are just drunk. Well, we know it's nine in the morning. Peter's going to say, oh, it's, it's only nine in the morning. <laughs> Who drinks and gets drunk at nine in the morning? This is not some drunken party. This is the work of the Spirit, Peter will say. Others mock the gospel. Now, we come to a close, and I can't help but to ask which crowd are you in? Maybe you're here this morning. You've not yet put your trust in the Lord Jesus. Young person, have you received the Holy Spirit? Let's get this down. God is working in the world. The Lord Jesus is birthing the church here. And we are now 2,000 years removed from this. And God is still working in the world. And He does it through His Spirit, the age of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. We're baptized into the Spirit of Christ, into the work of Christ, and we are filled with Him in that we are controlled by Him. We'll talk much more about that down the road. But let me ask you, have you been baptized with the Spirit? Is He inside of you? Has God done a work in your life just like He did here? You see, this is what the church is. The church is just not some dead institution. The church is the temple of the living God, the people of God. 
whereby we now go out into the world and spread the good news that Jesus Christ saves. Let me ask you, have you been saved? Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? I hope you have. I hope you've had, if I could use this word, had your Pentecost moment where the Spirit has come in and changed your life. I don't mean that you spoke in tongues. It's not always associated. Even if the gift does exist today, it's not always associated with the filling of the Spirit. But have, has the Spirit come to live inside of you? And do you see the evidence of the work of, of God in your life? Are you living out your salvation with fear and trembling? I hope that you have. If you've not trusted Christ, we beg you to come to Christ. And if you are a Christian, <clears throat> this is what God has done for you. Oh, may you also declare the mighty works of God to the world. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray together. Ask the Lord to continue to work in us. This morning, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, we beg you, come to Christ. What does it mean to come to Jesus? It means that you empty yourself of yourself. It means that you empty yourself of your sin. It means that you turn from your sin and you receive Christ. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe that God sent Christ to die on the cross for your sins. And that by believing in Him, you might have life in His name and that the Holy Spirit might come live inside of you. This is the good news. Maybe you're here this morning and you've sinned a great deal and you said, there's no hope for me. There is hope for you. There's hope for all of us who are sinners. There's no sin too great for God to forgive if we will turn from our sin and put our trust, our faith in Jesus Christ. He will save us from our sins. Fill us with the Spirit. Baptize us into the body of Christ, which is irrevocable, irrevocable forever and ever. We are His. If you've never trusted Christ, if you need encouragement, if you need prayer, if you need someone to counsel with you, come find me at the end of the service. I'd love to pray with you and encourage you and help lead you to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And if you're a believer, oh, may we be filled. May we continue to walk in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. If there's something in your life that you need to repent of, repent of that and walk by the Spirit faithfully. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for this incredible moment, a momentous moment in history where when the old covenant would be gone and the new covenant would come and the, spirit of, the age of the Spirit would come and the church would be born and Lord, many would be added as the Holy Spirit and dwelt them, came upon them. And Lord, that's who we are. We are products of the living God. We're products of your Spirit poured out into our hearts. Oh, help us never to forget that. Lord, we're Christians because you acted. Just as you acted on the day of Pentecost, so you act in, acted in our hearts. But we know but it's only by grace that we've been saved through faith. And this is not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Oh, Father, if we've been saved this morning, it's because you acted in our hearts and our lives. And you gave the promise. Oh, we're so thankful. Oh, may we, like these early believers, begin to proclaim the mighty acts of God to the world in order that they might hear as we go to our places of work and wherever we go, that we might spread the good news that Jesus Christ saves. Oh, I pray for those in this room, maybe a young person, maybe a mom or dad that have not yet put their faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that they wouldn't wait any longer. I pray, Father, that you would be gracious and merciful to them. Lord, that they would have their Pentecost moment. Believe on the Lord Jesus. Be saved forever. Bless your people, Father. Equip us. Grow us. Use this word now to produce much fruit in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us.
seated. The usher's going to usher you out, but just a last word to you. I want to encourage you. Have a great week. Hope you love the Lord and walk with Him. Not sure if I'll be here next Sunday. I think I mentioned this in the second service. Failed to mention in the first service. My son's getting married next Sunday, and so we pray that you'll rejoice with us. We're really excited about that. She's a godly young woman, and he's a godly young man, and so the Lord is working. He is taking a worship pastor job in Fairfax, Virginia, this is the power of God and His grace. Several years ago, an elders meeting, I wept with my elders that God would do a work in my son. And He did. He saved him. And now he's walking with the Lord. And we're so thrilled and so happy about what God's doing in his life. So lots going on. So I may be here next Sunday. I may not be here next Sunday. But the Word will still be preached. So I hope that you'll come. Have a wonderful time worshiping the Lord together. All right, Lord bless you. Have a wonderful week. The ushers will dismiss you. All right, Lord bless you. Oh.
No. Mm-hmm.